All right, can everyone hear me all right? Great, so um, I am incredibly ex excited to be speaking with you today. Uh, my name is Jason Lieberman, um, and I will be talking to you about something that I have called PMAPs. Um, but before I do that, just to give you uh, a few words of introduction about who I am and uh, how I came to be speaking to you today. Um, so I actually didn't have a traditional computer science background. I studied math and philosophy at school um, at UPenn. Um, after that, I spent a few years uh, working at an investment bank as a research analyst before uh, somewhat suddenly deciding that I want to learn how to code. Um, so I started out very much as a self-taught uh, programmer until I uh, was able to land a job at my current role um, where I am an engineer and I primarily use Scala um, at work. Um, but uh, Scala was actually the first language that I ever learned in a formal setting, which I think makes, uh, I don't know how common that is, but I loved it, so. Um, I actually do have a life outside of uh, just learning Scala. Um, I really enjoy reading and uh, I'm a huge philosophy nerd. Um, if you wanna talk to me about philosophy, please find me after. Um, and I've always wanted to open a bookstore, so all of my code examples today are gonna somehow reference books or bookstores or being a bookstore mogul, so everything in that theme will be continued throughout the talk, so you've been warned. Um, great, and what I do now. So I am what's called an investment engineer at Bridgewater Associates. If you haven't heard of Bridgewater, Bridgewater is the largest hedge fund in the world. We manage about $160 billion for our clients. And uh, what we do as investment engineers is really author and implement investment logic um, in code. So basically writing the uh, investment logic that will actually run um, the actual uh, hedge fund. And uh, we primarily use Scala to do that. Um, our engineering team is, uh, is pretty cool. Um, I love being a part of it. We have about 50 engineers. Um, and I'm uh, very engaged in kind of uh, you know, Scala training and really building a great uh, community of, uh, of engineers. Um, so I'm also really passionate about that. Um, we are hiring at Bridgewater. If you want to learn more about what we do at Bridgewater or are interested in, um, uh, you know, in what we do, please come find me. I think I'm the only one in the room wearing a cardigan. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I'll be around. Okay, great. So some context for my talk. So um, we all know maps, um, you know, it is a, uh, it's a fundamental abstraction that we use all the time, um, also known as a, you know, a collection of key value pairs. Um, and uh, Scala's immutable maps are incredibly powerful, incredibly uh, fast, and very useful in, you know, a number of different uh, applications. Um, but, you know, as I was using Scala's maps, there are some things that I didn't love about them. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily shortcomings, but some things that felt a little bit off to me. So um, what I did was I built this kind of small lightweight collection um, that I have called PMAPs, and uh, what I really am trying to do is just, you know, try to correct for some of the things that I didn't love about uh, native Scala maps. Um, and so basically, what I want to do in the next, you know, 25 minutes or so is define some of the important qualities that I think that uh, we should have in our key value pair collections. Um, some ways in which maybe maps aren't really reaching that bar. Um, and I'll introduce PMAPs and talk about how they uh, compensate. Um, and maybe have some time for some questions as well. Um, and while I will be talking about PMAPs and the kind of particular thing that I built, really what I want you to take away is that we deal with uh, a lot of different things all the time, and there's often an actual algebra of those things that might not actually exist um, in a rigorous way. So really the exercise that I've gone through and that I would encourage you all to go through is whatever you're working with, maybe it's tensors, um, like that, uh, the great talk that we just heard, or maybe it's maps, really whatever it is, I would encourage you to think about what is the algebra on the entities that I'm dealing with, um, then enforce that algebra in code, and then add syntax to make that algebra incredibly powerful. Um, so that's really the type of thing that I try to do in, uh, in building PMAPs. And also, I've only been you know, coding for a, about two years. Um, I think this is a great exercise for beginners to do because I think it really um, kind of teaches you like how do you, um, you know, how do you build an algebra in Scala? And I think that's a really uh, critical exercise. Um, okay, so 
what are some of the things that we want in uh, you know, collections of key value pairs? So I mean, this would apply to like a lot of different collections, I think, um, and this is not exhaustive, but some of the things that I would look for are, uh, firstly, I want it to be performant, so I want it to be fast. I want it to give me correct answers. Um, that's pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna go much into that today. Um, but I also want it to be principled. And so what do I mean by that? What I mean by principled is that um, operations are well-defined, transparent, and reflected in the type system. So when I do an operation on whatever entity I'm dealing with, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. It does what I expect it to do. It's clear to me that it's doing that, and what it's doing is actually reflected in the types that I'm dealing with. So that's kind of the type of thing I mean by principled. I also want it to be powerful. And what I mean by powerful is that I want my logic to be clean, concise, and expressive. I want to write little code, have it do exactly what I want it to, um, and no more. Like, I don't want to have to write anything that I don't need to. Um, and more tangibly, what I mean by this is uh, lifting algebra or logic to the collection level. So, you know, with maps, we'll have individual keys and values. Instead of dealing with the particular keys and values one at a time, I want to be lifting the algebra on those keys and values to the collection level. So that's kind of a theme that you'll see throughout, uh, throughout the talk. Okay, so back to native Scala maps. So um, I'm gonna walk through three simple cases of ways that I think Scala maps either aren't principled or aren't performant. So I love Scala maps. I don't think you should go turn around t tomorrow and say I'm no longer using Scala maps. These are just some things that kind of um, kind of bothered me in some, in some uh, sense. So the first thing is defaults. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you have tried to add a default to a Scala map, but I think it could lead to a lot of confusion. So here, again, I own a lot of bookstores, and uh, maybe I want to know uh, what ratings my users have given to specific books. Um, so you know, maybe I sell functional programming in Scala, also known as the Red Book, um, and maybe I've sold a bunch of copies and I have ratings. I have feedback from my users about the ratings that they've given it. So I have my, uh, my map up top. That's a map from book to rating. And then I add a default value. So here I just, uh, for simplicity, chose zero. I'm not sure if that's reasonable or not. Um, but what do I get back? I get back a map. There's no change in the type. There are actual, there are ways to find out if it has a default. It's a little bit nitpicky, but you can do it. But I have no idea that this default has been added. So if I'm working with this map and I send it downstream to a separate portion of my application, and then I look up a value, I really don't know what I'm getting. Um, and there's some even more confusing behavior because things like get, the get operation on a map, doesn't take into account the default. So it can, it can actually be quite confusing. Um, so in what sense is this not principled? So firstly, I have operations that um, I've fundamentally changed something about my map and that's not reflected in the type system. Um, so, um, and I think that's, that's a, you know, a problem. And I think the missing abstractions here are partial function versus function. So a map is very much a partial function. It's defined on sub, sub, some subset of keys, but not all keys, because you don't have, you don't necessarily have all keys of that type in your map. Um, if I add a default, that is no longer a partial function because I've specified exactly what I want to happen for every given key. So I think in that sense, there's something that's not quite principled about defaults on Scala maps. Um, the second case I'm gonna talk about is dropped keys. So I'm not sure if any of you have worked with maps and then suddenly you are somehow missing data or you have colliding keys. Um, I actually think what happens in maps uh, isn't great. Um, so, you know, maybe you want to do, uh, do some transformation of your map. So here, I'm looking at, for every book that I sell, I look at the quantity sold. So I have a map from book to quantity sold. Let's say I want to transform that into a map from author to quantity sold. So what do I do? Um, pretty straightforward. I iterate over my map. I, for every book that I have in my map, I go get all of the authors of that book because as you know, a book can have more than one author. And I uh, map each author then to a tuple of author and quantity. Um, does anyone see a problem with this? 
um, basically I could have colliding keys. Um, and also, I could have colliding keys in a way that won't actually pop when I run my program. So I won't actually know that I have these keys that are colliding and uh, I'll just be, you know, losing data. So, you know, Aristotle wrote the Nicomachean Ethics, he also wrote physics. So poor Aristotle, um, his quantity sold will be underrepresented because one of those keys will just arbitrarily be dropped. Um, so tying this back to, um, you know, the two, the two themes of principled and powerful. So it's not principled because it's not transparent what's happening. It's just kind of silently dropping keys. The same thing happens actually if I add an element to my map and I already have that key in the map, but I don't know that it's there. Um, so uh, there could be a number of ways using native maps that you could just silently drop keys. I would also say that this isn't powerful in some sense. And the reason I don't think this is powerful is because I actually know what I want to do when I have two books with the same author. I want to add the quantities. So my intent is to use the algebra defined on the value type and to lift that to the collection type in some sense. Um, but I don't have a way to actually express that using a map. So I really want to be adding the quantities, but I can't. Um, and instead I just get, you know, uh, arbitrary, um, some arbitrary uh, key. And the last case I'm gonna talk to you about is uh, what I'll call verbose key iterations. So we had uh, things like this kind of across our code base um, uh, when we were using, you know, pure uh, native Scala maps. So uh, the case is that, you know, I'm selling books all over the world and I have geographic regions. So maybe I have um, the US region, I have the European region, Asia and Africa. So in each one of these regions, I have a map from book to the quantity sold of that book in that region. And what I want to do is for any given book, I want to get the total quantity sold across all of my regions. So, okay, what am I gonna do? So this is uh, some sort of outer join if you're familiar with SQL, but it doesn't really look like that. What it looks like is, first I take all my maps, I get out the keys of my maps, um, I add my keys up together, I get the distinct set of keys, and then I iterate over my distinct set of keys, I go look up the value for that key in every map, and then in this kind of nested uh, loop over here, I can actually use the algebra defined on the value type, since I'm actually working with values at that point. But this is, this is a lot. Um, and really what I want to do is something incredibly simple, mainly add maps together. Um, I know what the algebra, I know the algebra that's defined on the value type, I just wanna lift that to the collection type. So really what I wanna be doing is US sales plus Europe sales plus Asia sales plus Africa sales. Okay, so those were kind of three kind of motivating um, examples for how I found that um, native maps were either not principled or powerful in some sense that I wanted them to be. Um, so what I did was um, I built something called PMAPs. And the P, um, it could stand for a bunch of things, still working that out, but um, it at least stands for principled and powerful. So I want my collections to be principled and powerful. And I also don't think this only applies to maps. Um, I think it's an interesting exercise to think about for all the kind of entities that we work with. Um, but basically what I did is, is pretty simple. I have this um, you know, abstract trait IP map, and there are two types of PMAPs. There is a PMAP and a PMAP with default. And so um, you'll notice also that a PMAP actually extends partial function, and a PMAP with default actually extends function. So um, the first thing that, the first success that we have off the bat is that I know what I'm dealing with. So if I have a PMAP that is uh, quite similar, you know, it's really, you could think of it just like a wrapper around a map, um, and I add a default to it, I don't, I no longer get back a PMAP. That is something different. And the difference between a partial function and a function is very much represented in the type system. So if I call with default value and try to cast it as a, or tell the um, type inference, uh, the compiler that it is a PMAP, it won't compile. Um, but 
what I do get back is a PMAP with default, which is just a function. So now I know that what I have will be defined for any key that I throw at it. Okay, so moving to the second case of dropped keys. So um, instead of just arbitrarily dropping keys when I do something that doesn't make sense, PMAPs will actually catch that. So if I try to um, call map or flat map over a map, a PMAP, um, it will not, it will fail if I try to map it to duplicate keys. So I'm just getting that added protection that, you know, when I do something nonsensical, I will get immediate feedback, you're doing something nonsensical. Um, so I could safely get my map from author to, uh, to quantity sold. Um, the other cool thing I could do is actually, um, so, you know, I mentioned before that in some sense there was missing, like, power. That what I really wanted to do is take advantage of the algebra defined on the value type and lift that, in some sense, to the collection. So I've defined some helper methods, like flat map sum, which will, um, you know, if I do map my uh, elements to duplicate keys, I know what I want to do, mainly I want to sum them. And in particular, all I need to know is that my value type is a monoid. So if I know my value type is a monoid, I could call flat map sum and it will do reasonable things. Okay, so moving to the third case of uh, verbose key iterations. So again, I don't want to look at this. I don't want to do this. Um, this isn't really, um, it's not clear what's going on. And it's, uh, you know, it's just very verbose, uh, very verbose logic for doing something very simple. Um, so what could I do with PMAPs? Um, so what I could do is actually use the algebra defined on the value type and lift it to the collection level. So, um, so here I have my four regions. Um, I've made them PMAP with defaults to indicate that maybe I don't have a book, maybe I didn't sell any books in a particular region, and I'll just assume that if I don't have one, it will be a zero. Um, I could literally just add these things together, and it will basically do exactly what I want it to. Um, so, you know, I'm adding these four maps together, I get that uh, PMAP with defaults together, and I get back another PMAP with default, which is great. Um, and depending on what I know about my value type, I could do more complex algebra. So if I know my value type is a vector space or a group, that enables me to do more complex, um, more complex operations at the PMAP level. So you'll see below that I could add US sales to Europe sales, subtract out Africa sales, and for fun, just multiply by two. So um, cool, so that's pretty neat. Um, let's talk about how, how and why this works. Um, and the way that this works is doing something that you can call a join. Um, so if you're familiar with SQL, a join is where you are kind of uh, matching on the keys of two tables and getting some combination of the value types. So maybe it's a tuple or maybe it's multiple columns in a, in a new table. Um, and the kind of conceptual basis of a join is pretty simple, especially if you're dealing with uh, PMAP with defaults where you know that those are actual functions. What could you do? If you have a function from A to B, a function from A to C, I could pretty simply get a function from A to the tuple of B and C, or really to any conceptual combination of B and C by just calling my uh, two functions. Um, so using that principle, it's pretty easy to define joins on, on maps. Um, and here, I've taken three of my PMAP, PMAPs with default, and I've uh, joined them together. And so what I mean by outer join here is that um, it will, uh, the keys that I'll get back will be the, uh, will include a key that's either in the left PMAP or the right PMAP. Um, and here's where it becomes interesting because the algebra of joins depends on which PMAP you're working with. So if you have PMAPs with default, first of all, you of course know that um, it won't fail because uh, even if you have a key in one but not in the other, they're both functions. So if you're missing a key in the actual underlying map, you still know what value to give that key. Um, so depending on whether you have a PMAP or a PMAP with default, the actual join algebra 
and the joins available to you could be different. Um, and so we've basically gone through and said what joins are well-defined, which joins uh, you know, give us the full algebra, and only defined those joins. Um, the other cool thing is that um, what do I get back when I join three pmaps? I get back a three tuple. Um, so I've just used tuples for simplicity. You could probably do this with a bunch of other things, like an applicative maybe might be helpful because then you could just kind of apply a function to the, um, to the value. Um, I mostly just did it for simplicity. It's, uh, you know, it's easy to read, easy to understand. Um, the, I, I think it's actually important that I don't get back a tuple two of a tuple two and a tuple one. Um, like I think that's incredibly annoying and I've seen APIs that when you call, uh, when you join things, you get like m massively nested tuples that are incredibly unwieldy. Um, but you could do some like type class magic to um, you know, get back a reasonable type and basically define the algebra of what type you want to get back when you do a join. Um, cool. So, um, so let's see how, what this looks like. So um, what do I use joins for or what are joins good for? Basically it allows you to lift um, the logic you want to do to the collection level or even more than that on, to do that logic on multiple collections. So here I'm taking you know, my four sales, uh, the sales of my four regions. I'm uh, joining them, so I get back a four tuple, and then I'm calling map values and just adding them together. So this is a, uh, a step in the right direction toward the, you know, the basic plus that I showed you, showed you all earlier. Um, but this is, the, this is like basically what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just define what I want to do at the collection level and basically under the hood, everything is kind of taken care of. Um, so what is this? Like, what is this conceptually? What we are, um, what we're actually doing is lifting properties of the value type to the PMAPs. Um, so, you know, maybe you know that V is a monoid, maybe you know that V is a vector space. Um, whatever you know about your value, if you can join two maps together, you basically get an algebra on the PMAPs for free. So if you know you can add two values, um, if, I, if I could add two elements of V, and I could join my PMAPs together, then I, could then I could add two PMAPs together. Because I join on the keys. When I have two keys, I know how to add them together. If I don't have a key, um, you know, and I'm working with PMAPs, I could also just uh, look at the zero of the monoid and use that as a default value. So basically, you could uh, pretty easily define an algebra on PMAPs um, that lifts the algebra that's defined on your value type. Um, the other cool thing is that if you use uh, you know, some like open source libraries, you could get some uh, pretty uh, cool syntax basically for free. So I just use Spire. Um, I found it like, pretty easy to use. Um, they have a lot of numeric type classes uh, kind of predefined and syntax for those type classes. So when I do something like, um, like the plus here, all I needed to do for this is prove that PMAP is a monoid if V is a monoid. And kind of the plus syntax just kind of came for free. Um, I could actually, uh, you might think that outer joins and even the plus operations only work if I have uh, PMAP with defaults. You could also um, PMAP with defaults because then I know what to do when I am when I don't have a key that is in one map but not the other. Um, you could also define it on PMAPs. It just won't make sense if you um, you know if you're if you don't have the same exact key set. So it will just fail. Um, but technically, the algebra does work. It just isn't safe. Um, okay. And just to say a word about how this is working under the hood before I wrap up. Um, so uh, it makes uh, heavy use of type classes. So if you can show that V um, is, you know, some, uh, like if there is some predefined algebra on your value types, you basically can do the same thing for your PMAPs. Um, so it basically uses implicit evidence to kind of prove things about your PMAPs that you know about your values. Um, and I also use um, dependent types uh, to basically define what I want to happen when I join two PMAPs together. So uh, I can basically define what, uh, what type I want to get out 
when I join, you know, a tuple two with a tuple two or a tuple two with a tuple one. Um, okay, great. So I've said a lot about PMAPs. Again, I just want to um, hammer home that um, the particulars of what I did um, are not necessarily what I want you to take away. Really, I think this was an, an incredible, um, you know, an incredible experience and opportunity because it put me through this exercise of taking something that we were using everywhere, which was maps. Think about what is the algebra that I want to be defined on maps. Define that algebra explicitly, um, whether on a whiteboard or whatever it is. Say, this is how I want my maps to behave. This is what I want the algebra to be. Then I enforce that algebra. Um, and in Scala, this is pretty easy to do um, using, uh, you know, you could use uh, like type classes, um, and it's, uh, you could get some pretty cool results with not that much code. Um, so, you know, this whole project isn't that big, um, but I think it actually can be very value additive um, when you're working heavily with maps. Um, and, uh, you know, once you enforce your algebra, it really helps to add syntax because that will make it incredibly powerful to, uh, you know, to author really, uh, not necessarily complex, but really powerful logic with few operations but that also map conceptually to how you think about these things in your head. Um, so you could find the code for PMAPs on GitHub if you are interested. Um, it is uh, very much in the state of a toy project right now. Um, I'm the only contributor, um, but uh, feel free to you know, reach out if you're interested um, or have questions. Um, and if you uh, have thought about this problem, I would love to hear um, you know, how you're thinking about it, what libraries like, would be cool to look at. Um, I'd love to, to hear more, um, so feel free to find me afterwards. Um, and with that, I'll uh, open it to any questions that you all have. Yeah, um, yeah, so uh, there are a few different libraries that have like particular pieces of what I did in PMAPs, and like I, I was definitely heavily, heavily influenced by them. Um, I didn't find that there was kind of one thing that was rich enough to kind of handle, handle what I was going for. Um, in particular, things like, uh, you know, handling weird cases with defaults, um, because I wanted to kind of make that like a strongly typed thing that very much constrained, like, like how, where I wanted to take this. Um, but for sure there are like a bunch of uh, libraries that have, you know, like different subsets of what I did in PMAPs. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you prefer working with a PMAP with defaults of PNB instead of just a map of K and option fee? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I think it uh, really comes down to like, maybe this is just an aesthetic thing, but um, you know, just dealing with options and uh, you know, just dealing with options or wrapped values, it just makes it harder to express my logic like cleanly. So if I have options, then I, you know, I always need to be working in option space. And you know, maybe I need to do like a bunch of four comprehensions, or you know, do, like continue doing dot map, dot flat map. Um, and I think it actually very much detracted from what I was going for, which was like the like very much powerful and straightforward. So it's like very simple to like do what I want to do. I don't need to think about like wrapping, unwrapping, like what is, you know, just those kind of uh, nitpicky things I felt like were detracting, but that is very much a way to approach this. And there's actually kind of a lift function that I built that you could take a PMAP, you call like dot lift, and it basically gives you back a PMAP with default where your, um, your default is none. So um, that could that and that of course could be useful in a lot of uh, in a lot of places. But that was definitely something we thought about as well. One more question. Okay. Uh, can, can you quickly show the constructor for PMAP with default? Says. Um, yeah, it's not. I don't think I have it here, but it's basically. Yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, it basically just takes a map and a default, which is a function from k to v. So there's other operations on pmap with default that take a monoid? Yeah. Did you consider using the zero for monoid instead of having a default for the instance here? 
Yeah, so that's definitely something that I am actively thinking about. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it should be since the like default zero is so ubiquitous that it might make sense to have that be like a separate thing. Maybe it's like, maybe it inherits from PMAP with default. I'm not sure. Um, but that like zero, like that uh, default zero is something that's used everywhere. And in like 95% of cases, when we have that, we just call dot with default, well, dot with default value of zero. Um, you could also, um, yeah, there, there are a bunch of functions that have it like built in that basically implicitly take the monoid of the value and allow you to do like more powerful operations when you do know that it is a monoid. But I haven't, yeah, I haven't explicitly built in like the um, default zero as a like first class type of a PMAP. Yeah. It might make the API more clear to a semi-group instead of a monoid, maybe? Um, yeah, I'm not sure, but I'll think about that, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks.